on that because when we when we really started setting out on okay who, who are we and what what's the story we want to tell we were excited about the idea in our minds we were social media 2.0 right if you think back to 20 years ago when social media really started kind of becoming in our consciousness as a society it was like well this is great i'm going to i'm going to stay in contact with people and i'm going to be able to develop these relationships and i'll get to know more and more and more and more people but what actually happened was the people that are the loudest get the most attention. The people that aren't screaming at you fall to the wayside and then you, you lose touch and you lose contact with them. And it's, it's really a harmful thing. You know, we have a, um, he's actually a CEO of a pretty large company here in town and he's been using Juggle. And he says, he says to us one day, he goes, man, I, I gotta tell you, I'm really enjoying Juggle because it's forcing me to have real conversations with people. And I didn't realize what's happened to me is that everything I do from an efficiency standpoint is about one to many communication. I want to send a letter out to a lot of people. I want to send a text out to a lot of people and send an email out to a lot of people, right? What Juggle's forcing him to do is be like, hey, my secretary, Paula, who I hired three weeks ago, I still don't know who her husband's name is, you know, or I don't know what her kids are, or where their kids are at and stuff like that. So he's like, I sit down and I intentionally say, when Brenda comes up, I'm gonna go do a walk with her for 15, 30 minutes to get to know her and to get to understand to her. And as, of course, as a business owner, you understand that those conversations is where the, where the gold is from a connection standpoint, but then also just from, a, from an ability to, to kind of grow that relationship and, and you know, get more out of, of them and their life, right? So, so these are the kind of conversations that we're having. Welcome to Winning Strategies Playbook, the podcast where we welcome business leaders, CEOs, and industry experts to discuss the rise to the top, building wealth, and real estate insights. Here's your host, Jeremy Spann. Welcome to Winning Strategies Playbook. For more information on this podcast and other podcasts, go to our website, myexperiencedrealtor.com. That's experience with an ED. And uh, you can click on the podcast button, download this episode, other episodes on all the different platforms, or even listen to it from the actual website itself. From there, you can also, if you're going to buy and sell real estate anywhere on the planet, go to the homepage, click on Find a Trusted Professional, and we'll make sure you get connected with somebody that will represent your interests. But we're here today to click on that podcast button in the Read More. Chuck Baligny. Yes, sir. Did I pronounce your name right? Boligny is good. There's All right. how, do, several, how do we do that? Well, if you're French, we go Boulinay. Boulinay. So nobody does that. So we no. go Boligny is the uh, bastardized American version. Okay. Well, yeah. I, excellent. You did good. You did good. <laughs> you did better than 60% of telemarketers. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> so for the audience, Chuck and I have known each other for quite a few years. I pretty much helped him pay his mortgage payment with my ability to lose to him in poker, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But my father-in-law says, I have to start every one of these off with a joke. Now, he wants me, after this many episodes, to stop doing jokes. So now I do these to intentionally annoy him, (laughs) which I was just excited to learn that my father-in-law was actually listening to these. So you ready for this? And I thought this one was fitting for our poker. Bring it. Did you hear about the blonde who brought a bag of French fries to the poker game? No, I did not hear about this. Oh, somebody told her bring her own chips. That's it. Ah, well done. Horrible, horrible. Nice to see you, Mr. Span. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, it's too bad my jokes are as bad as my poker plan. Uh, you know, yeah. So poker, we've known each other for oh, quite six, seven quite, years, yeah. I'd say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and then uh, seeing each other every month down at the Fort Worth Club, seeing each other up. I mean, actually, I remember one night you and I went to the library because you usually – may get pretty far in these poker tournaments <laughs> and this particular one you didn't and we went do you remember the night i'm talking about yes. and we went down to the library and i don't mean like the public library I was say yes specify yes. for the audience yeah it was and, not the library thank goodness that there's a thing called uber <laughs> because <laughs> it was definitely uber taking me home yes. that night yes and uh and we were talking as a matter of fact one of the things you were talking about was <laughs> opening a, a a bar you know you were talking about potentially doing that which you ultimately did and i'm sure you were 
definitely listened to the advice when I told you not to go do it. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. How's that going? No, I think you actually said, whatever you do, don't do it, but I know you're not going to listen to me. It's going to be a ton of fun. (laughs) And you were wrong on both of those. Um, Yeah, it's going okay, man. You know, COVID was a a tough year for us, for sure. Yeah. But uh, I think we're going to survive. You know, it's... um, we're digging out. There's some construction in the area. And once that clears up and now that people are coming back out, um, I really think we're going to be okay. And it's over off Magnolia. And Correct. what's the name of it? It's called Grandma's. Grandma's. So, yeah, Magnolia and Hemphill, about a mile from downtown. Yeah. Um, super cool area right in the heart of near south side there, which is pretty much where my whole world revolves around right now. Cool. That's where we're going after this, right? Heck yeah. Heck I actually, yeah. I, I actually do have a happy hour there after this. So. Oh, well, then I'm so going. to get I, moving. I haven't, I haven't been in there yet. <laughs> yeah. Because I mean, of this whole COVID thing and being gone and all that. But more importantly, <laughs> let's talk about Chuck. <laughs> Chuck, tell us your story. Where are you from? How did you get to where you're at? Oh, man. Um, where does the journey begin? The journey begins in a little town called Columbia, Maryland, which is uh, almost exactly in between Baltimore and D.C. And uh, Columbia is a really interesting town, which, which kind of comes back in my story later. But Columbia was actually founded as a, a planned community. We literally started with, there was 3,000 people back in 1970. I was born in 1976. There's now over 115,000 people there. Um, It's the second largest city in Maryland. And it was planned basically from the get. We're going to have 10 villages. Each village has three communities. Each community has a grocery store and a high school and a grade school and all this kind of stuff. Um, And I bring that up because it was... It was, it was interesting, almost like a, a Petri dish. It was a lot of, like the Truman Show, you know? Like it was just very planned and rigid. And uh, furthermore, my mother was a librarian and my father was an accountant. So obviously I was set up for some pretty dynamic, you know, career advice and, and uh, you know, potential in that respect. Um, but what I did get from my father was certainly a, a love of um, numbers. <laughs> He's an accountant. Um, no pun intended yeah, with the whole right. poker thing, right? <laughs> There's a little bit in there for sure. Um, he used to run all of the charity events, which there was a lot of like big six wheels and stuff like that. I remember vividly like counting quarters all night long for charity. Um, so that was that was definitely part of my story. Um, and then, of course, my mother, I just learned a lot for love of community. Uh, she was actually part of um, the uh, archdiocese in Baltimore. So um, I went to private school from first grade all the way through high school. Um, because she worked for the archdiocese we didn't have a ton of money but but uh that was one of the benefits for sure and i'm 99 percent sure that's why she did it was to get us a good education um but i bring all that up because it was a very like i said just regimented and i feel like i've always kind of had this creativity bursting to get out um combine that with the reality that you know my dad probably taught me a lot of my entrepreneurial spirit but it wasn't through um do what i do it was do it as do as i say um, he always kind of instilled in me that, hey, if you're going to do anything in this world, you got to do your own business. You got to get after it. You got to figure things out. You got to do all that. Meanwhile, he kind of had a nine to five job working for the county government and he just he freaking hated it. And every day I watched him come home and pass out on the lazy boy and wake up and do it again the next day, an hour there, an hour back. You know, and it was just it's one of those things that's very vivid. You know, obviously I was I was thinking about this, you know, uh, driving over here. And uh, so that was kind of where I got that spirit. And then I moved to Boston. Um, So I went from 95% Roman Catholic uh, environment to Boston. So it was 98% Roman Catholic. So I thought I was getting out of it, but I was just right back in the middle of this somewhat, you know, conservative uh, town and nature and all this. But I went to a business school up there. The one thing I'd learned from grade school was I loved marketing. I loved branding. Um, I was always our treasurer too, because mainly because I like to count the money. But then I would always be like, well, how do we make how to make a bigger yard sale? How to make a bigger bake sale? How do we do more of this, more of that? You know, it's both for nonprofits and then for our classes and stuff like that. So I went to school up in Boston at a school called Bentley College, later, later became Bentley University. Um, great business school, um, se- high, second highest uh, marketing program in the country for business school when I went there. That's why I went there. Again, I didn't know a lot about it other than I just like branding and marketing and consumer behavior and why people do certain things, packaging. Um, all of those kind of things, advertising. So I get to school, you know, go go through that for four years. But during those four years where I'm adamant that I'm a marketing guy, that's literally why I relocated to Boston, uh, this thing called the uh, the Internet came out. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's um it's a connection of tubes. And Is that the same wires. thing as the World Wide Web? It's it's on the same on ramp to the information <laughs> superhighway. So uh, yeah, and these are the conversations we're having in, in yeah. 1994, right? Like right. this thing is really it's it's kind of interesting, right? And I remember distinctively going down to University of Maryland where all my friends were, and they had the graphical World Wide Web, whereas what we had was the text-based World Wide Web. 
so you're just going on, you know, just seeing text, but it was still fascinating, right? And uh, I remember somebody hanging up a flyer on campus and it said, come see the graphical internet. And I'm like, or the World Wide Web, you know? And I'm like, I've already seen it. It's awesome. It's amazing. And I go down there in the, you know, in the dungeon of one of these uh, dorm rooms and, or dorm, uh, you know, dormitories. And there's 30 IT people and me, and I'm the only marketing guy. Everybody else is just an IT, hardcore IT guy. And uh, I was fascinated by it. And I didn't really understand its application to marketing at the time, but it certainly felt like, man, this is, this could be huge. Like, this is really, really interesting. So, uh, so over those four years, I was super adamant that I'm a marketing guy. Meanwhile, you know, we all had to have a laptop. I'm breaking my laptop. I'm banging on the laptop. I take it to the lab every other day to fix it. And I'm slowly but surely kind of learning how computers work, how technology works, how the internet works, uh, to the point where, you know, I blew through my life savings and, you know, three months, I think, when I got to school, so I needed a job. So then I go work in the computer lab. They're all IT majors, and I'm here a marketing guy. Start running the lab, start kind of running the lab as a business. I start really getting into it, right? So fast forward to when I graduate, I'm a marketing guy. I go out and do what every other marketing major did, which is get a job in advertising or public relations. I got a job in public relations. I'm looking around the table, and everybody there is miserable, and everybody there is, you know, been there 15, 20 years, and I'm an assistant account executive that needs to be there for three years before I can be an account executive, before I can be an account manager, before I can be an account supervisor. Meanwhile, I got buddies that were in IT that are like Windows NT administrators making, you know, 150 grand a year or something. And I was like, this is what year? This is 98, 99. Wow, that's a lot of money back in 98. 100%, yeah, especially yeah. for getting out of school. And I, I think I literally made 28 grand, you know, as a, as a PR guy. Um, you know, after going to, to, to private college like that, it's, it's not a good, not a good long-term plan to get out of debt. So, uh, so I called up a recruiter friend that graduated with me and I said, man, I think I want to get into IT if you can find something. So he found me a job as, as a help desk administrator for a childcare company, <laughs> hmm. which I didn't know any better. And I said, okay, I'll take it. And I think it mm -hmm. paid 60, which is again, pretty sweet Double for what a you're 21, making. 22 yeah. year old. I was like, I'm just going to do it. We'll see what happens. And uh, it got really interesting because that, that child care company, um, you know, I got in, I set up the help desk, but kind of some of my entrepreneurial and business interests kind of kicked in and it wasn't all about IT for me. It was really about, let me go to the marketing department. Let me go to the finance department. Let me go to the real estate department learn what they're doing and see if I can help them use technology to improve their processes, improve what they're doing, right? So then I got a really good look under the hood of this child care business, right? Um, through those conversations, that company is called Mulberry Childcare. I tried to merge with a company down here out of Arlington. It was called the Children's Courtyard. And the merger didn't happen, um, but they kind of fell in love with our CFO, a guy by the name of Ed Fallon. And they. Who's, who's they? The, um, oh, the people down here. Yeah, okay. Children's Courtyard folks, which is a company that started in Arlington in 1986. It had grown to about 20 childcare centers at this point. Okay. And uh, it's a really interesting industry, too, because there's it's like a two billion dollar industry, but no one player owns more than one or two percent of it, certainly really? at the time. So it's super fragmented. So when you have 20 schools, you're all of a sudden like number 10 in the country, number nine in the country for like, in terms of units. So all these top companies are acquiring these five, 10, 15, 20 unit schools to just, you know, kind of they're all public and they need to grow and show growth and all those things. So it was just super fascinating. Right. Like on one hand, I'm in child care and I'm in I.T. On the other hand, I'm learning all this stuff about you know, multi-location units, multi-location uh, businesses, the real estate side. Um, I got ahead of myself there a little bit. So Ed, Ed moves down here to run this company. He's down here three or four months. Again, this is 1999, 2000. Some of the IT talent hadn't flooded into Texas yet, you know? So he calls me up. He's like, man, I need, a, I need an IT guy. And I'm like, I've never been to Texas and I've never had interest in Texas. So he's like, well, come down and visit. And I met all the guys and they were amazing. And I said, I'll take it. And then I partied for 13 days and I had to be down here on the 14th day. So <laughs> that was a long drive. Rent, <laughs> rented a truck, filled it all up <laughs> that morning and moved down here and uh, was absolutely crying myself to sleep the first night. I was absolutely terrified. Second day I met everybody and it's just been an absolute uh, blast ever since. So that was 20 years ago. So I moved to IT. Uh, I moved down here. I'm working in IT. I'm basically setting up the same thing I did up there. Uh, we had 20 locations around Texas at the time. Over the next four years, we built about 30 schools. So I was doing a lot of like, you know, hardware, hardware installation, VPN installation, a lot of training, but then also just trying to bring on new people, bring on new, new systems, bring on new technology, and of course, integrating into the business model itself. 2004 comes around. I've been doing it for four years. Our growth kind of slowed a little bit. And I was like, man, I think I'm, I think I'm done. I think I'm going to go do something else, but hey, I really appreciate your time. 
And Ed said, hey, I think it's going to get really interesting here. Why don't you stick around? What can I do? And I said, well, I don't know. He's like, well, I'm going to put a bonus plan in place. So he puts this pretty aggressive bonus plan in place. And instead of taking him up on that, I said, hey, why don't you keep the money? Why don't you pay for me to go back to TCU and get my MBA? I would like to do that, and that will keep me here for another two three years. And he said yes. And I thought I pulled the wool over his eyes, but really I didn't know at the time. But they were prepping that company for sale. And Ed really wanted some like a right hand man, especially on the technical side, to help, you know, aggregate all the due diligence for all these companies that were in town. So while I went back to TCU, I not only got my MBA, but I spent basically a year and a half um, doing the dog and pony show for these other large national child care companies that were coming in town to look at our, our schools and look at our facilities. So I really got to learn like under the hood of what was going on and all this. So sure enough, 2006, I graduate or, you know, I finished my MBA uh, program and almost the same month they sold that company, uh, 55 locations. I think it was 66, $70 million. Um, and it was just awesome. So I'm like, okay, I'm done with school. I'm done with the childcare. Like, what do I do now? Right. And I literally had about 60 days there where I, I wasn't sure. And it was just, we'll see what happens at the last minute. The company who bought us out, they said, Hey, we like what you're doing so much. We want you to keep building for us. Well, the guys who just sold were like, man, that's a great deal. But like, we just made a lot of money and we don't want to work anymore. So, hey, why don't, why don't you and you and you go start this real estate development company? So me and two other guys basically started a real estate development company where we're building schools for the people that just acquired this brand, right? We, we had a great deal. It was, they, they were buying off of pre-prescribed multiples based on performance down the road. They didn't you know, want to keep the losses off their books and all this kind of stuff. So it got really, really interesting really, really quick. We built three schools almost immediately, and they, they, they got to a performance level and sold them off. Then we had about 16, 17 in the pipeline, and then 2008 happened, and then they backed out of the deal. Now all of a sudden we're building schools. We're paying them to run the schools, and you know they're not doing a good job with it, to be, to be blunt. So now it's like, okay, well, Chuck, you kind of know what's going on in all these schools. Why don't you go figure it out? So I spend about a year going around to the schools and seeing what's going on, seeing where we can make improvements and seeing where we can, you know, inject something that might make a difference. And, uh, you know, basically it comes back. It's like, look, I'm, I'm not their boss. We're paying somebody else to run these schools. Why don't we just bring the schools back in house? We can run them ourselves and then, you know, sell them to somebody else at some point or something along those lines. And that's ultimately what we did. We took the schools back. And then, of course, now we have two companies out there running with the same name. So I was like, we need to rebrand. So I, I promise you I'm getting somewhere with all this. <laughs> so, so we, I told you you're going to do talking in the so, 90% so, of the time. So, yeah. we, uh, so, we, so we rebrand the schools and we go through this process. And I work with a couple of larger agencies in town. And I was really disappointed with kind of how they tackled our business needs. And through that process, I met a, a mutual uh, friend, uh, Chris Botvidson, who had a, you know, a marketing agency called Ascend. So we worked on rebranding those schools for a year. And then when I got done with that, um, actually through that process, what was going on, my, my mother uh, was diagnosed with brain cancer, uh, diagnosed and had a stroke in March, diagnosed in April, passed away in October. And basically every other weekend I'm flying back and forth to Baltimore. And it's just like, it's just, a, it's just a beating, 2010. Yeah. So it's just, it was just an absolute beating. I'm like, what am I doing with my life? You know, like this is not, <laughs> this is not a good, good situation. Um, so those two things kind of happened almost at the same time. So finally, when I, we get done with that branding process, I became pretty good friends with Chris. Chris is like, you should come back and do what you love. It's branding. It's marketing. Like, let's go build this agency together. And that was pretty attractive, especially with what I just gone through with my mother. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do that. So I left all the childcare stuff behind, basically started working with Chris and we started the next five years, you know, building the send concepts, which was a full service branding agency, right? A lot of creative and graphic design. So we're doing that for a while, you know, and you'll see a theme in my life. I just kind of, I kind of, get antsy and I'm, I'm bouncing around to these things I have interest in. And uh, one of the guys from the old company called me up and he said, hey, I, I've been passively investing in hotels around Texas. And I know you know a lot of people in your South Side and Fort Worth and what's going on there. Do you think you could find us a site? And I was like, yeah, sure. Sounds fun, right? So what I didn't know at the time was with, with Ascend Concepts, what I was learning was, I, I guess you'd call it sales, really like business development, right? But for me, it's something I was never able to do before, which was just go out and build relationships to find people like you, to find people like you know other business owners, people that need help with marketing and branding services. 
I was having a blast doing that. And I was just basically building a Rolodex knowing that not everybody needs a website tomorrow. Not everybody needs social media management tomorrow, but at some point they do. And I want to be the person they think of and I want them to come to Ascend Concepts, right? So I just doing all this networking and business development. So when this guy calls me up and says, hey, we want to do, you know, we want to build a hotel in the area. Can you find a spot? I'm like, well, this is cool because now I can go talk to all these realtors and title people and property owners and all these people I know that I don't have any work for, right? So uh, so long story there, we, we find a site, we close on it. Just I literally just did it for fun to help out a friend. And when we closed on it, they said, hey, man, we really appreciate you helping us out with this. We're going we're gonna to cut you in on this. You own a piece of this. I was like, cool. That's awesome, man. I really appreciate doesn't it. Like, suck. yeah, it doesn't, it does not suck. So, uh, so then the next question was, uh, I said, Oh, cool. Like, how, how do you build a hotel? And they said, Oh, w- we don't know. Do you know? And I was like, <laughs> no, I don't. And I was like, but I'd love to figure it out. And if you guys are up for it, like I'll go, I'll go spend a ton of time on that. And they're like, yeah, let's do that. So, um, I sold out of Ascend Concepts to Chris and started down this road of, real estate development. So I've already been in real estate development. I've done the commercial side with these child care centers. I think I've been involved in something like 80 or 90 of these buildings between Mulberry and, and the courtyard in the, the third brand, which was called Explore. Um, but not, nothing to this scale, nothing in hospitality, not all these kind of conversations, right? So, uh, so that was, you know, a couple years ago and I left Ascend and I started doing um, the hotel process and that's a whole nother story. But basically, um, you know, we decided to wait on the hotel for, for about a year or two for a number of reasons. Um, we've just started firing it up again. But in those two years that I've since Ascend, since I've gotten out of Ascend and been working on the hotel and other projects, other opportunities have popped up because of these relationships that you that you people you've been talking to and seeing and things like that. So as you alluded to, one of those opportunities was um, a bar that was in near Southside that I just thought was super underutilized and could be given a new life and a new birth. It helped me create another community. I wanted to build another team, and ultimately, I love building brand. Uh, so we rebranded to Grandma's, and that was um, we did that at the end of October of nineteen, and then our grand opening was the day that. COVID came in and said, you have to close down all the bars right now. So that's been another interesting part of this year. Um, Working with another friend on a digital marketing company. Um, Obviously, we're still doing the real estate development. We bought some other properties in near Southside. Um, What else? What made you choose the name Grandma's? So great question. Um, And not everybody gets it. And that was kind of part of the story, right? Like I wanted it to be kind of ubiquitous at some point where people are like, let's go to grandma's. And if you got it, you got it. And if you didn't, well, come get it. Like, right. I, I want you to come. I want you to kind of understand it. Right. But really it's a, it's a 97 year old building. It's a cool old school vibe and environment. And I really wanted a place that everybody was familiar with and everybody could kind of relate to. And everybody ha- kind of has a, a grandma story or a grandma feeling, even if it wasn't your grandmother, you knew somebody who kind of welcomed you into their home and welcomed you into their space. You know, near Southside's a great community. It's super diverse. Um, there's just a lot of cool stories that are going on there, and I just kind of wanted it to be that that welcoming area. So that's kind of where we came up with grandmas. And um, that's pretty cool. Yeah, though. It's been fun. Yeah. So it's a long story. So the reason I tell you all that is because everything I do is real estate. You know, I got this marketing and branding, and then I've kind of got this technology bend to it as well. So what I gather from this, and it's not surprising knowing you for a long time, is. You're just like me. You're ADD like a squirrel on methamphetamines, and we're never satisfied, and we're always in that search for that next shiny object, that next thing. That it's always go, 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 um, which can be exhausting, right? 100%. Not, not, not yep. just exhausting for other people like our significant others, but even for ourselves because we can carry a level of energy that confuses most people but when we go down, we go down like a darted rhino, don't we? <laughs> man. Like, Putting like, it lightly. Oh, man. Yep. And, uh, and so, and, so let's, let's segue just, just for a second because now this really makes sense is that constant search of adventure, what, when did poker become a part <laughs> of that? Um, you know, my, like I said, my growing up with my, my dad always kind of running a lot of these 50-50 kind of deals, the big six wheel and, and things like that. Um, that was really the only time I spent with my dad on a lot of levels was, was literally counting money for charity, for nonprofits. And it was the lessons of what gambling is, right? And back in 2003, 2004, when I was kind of searching for something else to do on the side, especially after I moved down here and I didn't know a ton of people, 
the online poker world was taken off. And there was just a lot of opportunity to just log in, learn a little bit about the game, which is a lot more than most of the people playing, and you could make some pretty decent money at it. So that's really where it came from. It's, it's since kind of evolved into this obsession where you're like, <laughs> it's a really fun game. Speaking and it's it. just like life too, right? I'm sorry, I cut oh, you off yeah. there. But it's like life. It's, yeah. You can do everything right and still get screwed. Oh, yeah. And you can do everything wrong and make out like a bandit. Oh, man. And, you know, it's <laughs> kind of funny. So for the audiences, Chuck and I have been playing in a monthly game together for a number of years in, um, in, in, in a tournament style. And, uh, and I've enjoyed it because not just – because you're right. Sometimes you're doing everything right. You have the hand, and sure enough, the river comes out, and you're like, you got to be shitting me, <laughs> right? Sid, with his two threes, ends up having a pair of fours, and you're like, what? Come on, or four of a kind. You're like, you're like, come on. Uh, but it was the camaraderie down there. Everybody talking shit to each other, and it just, it, and it was just, it was just that I, I couldn't wait for the second Thursday of the month, knowing that I was going to go down there, and did, we were just going to have fun. And then the pandemic hit, right? And then so that's when we all went to online. And what I learned is I'm a much better online poker <laughs> player than I am a face-to-face poker player, probably because you can read my expressions easy. I'm like, I'll raise. And you're like, oh, that's something that's got to flush. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, but nobody can read my face right. on online poker. And I think you and I were joking the other day is like when the same group of guys, and then it grew quickly to like 100 guys, and, uh, and, and and all of a sudden, I, I think I called you one day, and I was like, hey, I'm doing actually pretty good at this online thing. And you're like, yeah, I mean, I think I'm thinking like 20 grand in the last month. I was like, yeah, dude, I'm up like 15. This is great. And it was like, do we have to go back to the face-to-face now? <laughs> <laughs> all right, we got to redact some of that. <laughs> yeah, but like, hey, no, you know, never mind. But I lost it all again, IRS, yeah, absolutely, so I'm at a watch. Absolutely, I'm at, absolutely. Yeah, lost it all, I'm at a watch, IRS. Uh, but, but, yeah, I mean, it was just – but there was something about poker, right, it, which is fun because there is a level of strategy involved. But at the same time, it is there's a reason they call it gambling, right? Sure, you sure. just – things that – which you're right, comes kind of comes into place with business is you can do absolutely everything right, letter of the law, and the tables get turned on you. And then sometimes – you. You're just trying to figure it out, fly by the seat of your pants, and you're like, "Did I just really crush that? Like, oh my gosh! Like, how did that? How the hell did that happen?" And uh, or is like in my case, many a times is not paying attention and just going, "Yeah," and then realizing, "Oh man, I really got a good hand," and I didn't even realize I had a good hand. Uh, you know, so that is the funny thing about you know the the life of poker and, and gambling and and whatnot and how some people really take it all too serious 100 percent. yep yep <laughs> hey look if you're not willing to lose money then just don't show up well it teaches you to make decisions with imperfect information right i mean that's all that's all businesses that that's is. all we've done right so like if you look at um the pandemic right i bought a bar that was treading water with with little to no marketing effort thinking okay that's our baseline is break even everything else we can do is going to be up from here. And then day one, something none of us have ever seen, something our parents have never seen, something most of our grandparents have never seen, ironically called grandmas, is a nat, you know, in, in national or an international pandemic where all of a sudden things are shut down and people don't know what's next. And we don't know if it's going to be a week, a month, a year, two years, 10 years. Um, so you got to read and react and you got to play with that. And it was a really tough year specifically with the bar. Um, but I think you know, in a, in a perverse way, poker helps with that because you understand that this is one hand in the game of life and yeah. we're going to figure it out. And I, I think that's important for people to understand that want to be entrepreneurs. It's like at the end of the day, there is no sure thing, right? You There are things that you can control, but there are so many elements that you cannot control. And the what I have found that has helped me in business is quickly identify the things you actually have control over and quickly become okay with the things that you don't right. have control over, right? You don't have control over people's spending behaviors, buying behaviors, what the government's going to decide to do, whether it be on a local, regional, state, national, international level, whichever. It, there's so many complexities in there, but you also have to be able to see the forest through the trees, right? Because I think a lot of people just, they shut down, they quit, and there's no quit in guys like you and I, right? Like, <laughs> like habitual 
degenerate gamblers. Like we will blow the whole thing just to be able to say, <laughs> no, I'm going to get there. And, 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 and for guys like us is sometimes that journey's worked out really well and sometimes it hasn't, but we climb back on that horse and go riding again. Right. Yep. Yeah. Well, going back to my childhood, right? Like what's the alternative? Right. Is the alternative just to, to get that nine to five and, and grind it in a, in a way, in a lifestyle that you don't necessarily enjoy? I mean, some people do. I get that. But that's not it's not what I've wanted. It's not how I'm built. It's not what you've wanted. It's not what you've built. Yeah. And, I, and you know, I mean, I, 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 I grew up in a very structured world going in the Marines at 17, right? Paid on the 1st and the 15th. Easy rules. Just don't get dead. Kill the bad guys. You'll be okay. You'll get paid on the 1st and the 15th. And you get out. <laughs> going to the PD for the number of years, paid, you know, every other week. And then after also going to TCU to get an MBA, making that jump, going to the business world two years later, did not work out well at all. Lost everything, holding the bag for $4 million, sitting there, August of 2016. And, yes, one of the options was go back and get a safety of a check, get paid every other week have benefits go back to the pd start all over go rise through the ranks again but and it's not that i didn't like the pd and it not that i didn't like the people that i worked with but that was not who i was that i'd rather be waterboarded in guantanamo bay than to go back to that because i knew there was more out there and i was not going to quit i was not ready to quit and it was like, hey, I could take my ball and go home. Boo-hoo, what was me? Or, hey, you know, let's let's strap up and get this get this pony going. Right. And now, five years later, been very fortunate how things have worked out. But I don't think that I would have had the successes I've had without the failures I experienced, right? 100%. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Teachable moments. <laughs> Yeah, and you know that's I, I kind of rambled there on my whole story, but I, I really it, I do enjoy telling, it, especially you know people I'm helping out or I'm mentoring or, or younger people. It's because it's so nonlinear. Like you just don't know what one thing is going to lead to the next, and that starts with just taking a chance, imperfect information, moving forward, and seeing what comes from that. Um, that's that's really kind of been the story of, of why I'm here today. Yeah, and then you go through all this and you just decide to go ahead and start yet another company, <laughs> right? I mean, hey, why start one when you can start 10, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, so, where, where are you going to invest your time, right? So, uh, yeah. so yeah, ironically, somebody else that we play we play poker with, um, who's obviously become a really good friend over the last year, year and a half, um, he saw my name on an email list of another project I was working on, completely unrelated. And he's like, why is Chuck copied on this message? He's like, that's the guy who runs the poker league. So he calls me up. He's like, I think we need to go out, have a drink. I need to learn more about you, you know. So, so we went and started talking through things. And, I, you know, I had another business that was kind of failing at that time. And I was kind of transitioning to doing some other stuff. I think that was when the hotel kind of got put on hold. And he said, uh, you know, what, what would you want to do? Like, what would be good for you? And I didn't know anything about what he was working on. And I said, you know what I think I'd be really good at is a number two in a startup in the tech industry for somebody who has the idea and the skills that needs help bringing it to market. I literally said that. And to his credit, he didn't say another word to me at that moment. We came back another you know, week later and he goes, let me, let me show you what I got. Let me show you what I'm working on. And that's where we're at today basically is this, this, this program that he's literally spent five, five years working on. It's an app. And I just think it's absolutely brilliant. And I could not come up with a reason why I wouldn't want to go headfirst into this. And this is about a year and a half ago that, that I joined, joined up with him. Um, but basically, it's called Juggle, right? And the idea behind the app is it helps you build habits to stay close to people who matter most to you. I mean, we all have those stories of a guy from high school or a teacher or a professor or a mentor, sometimes family members, relatives that you just lose touch with and you wish you were better about it. Six months becomes a year, becomes 18 months, becomes 24 months. And we, we don't have that opportunity to go back. And we get so in our head about, well, now it's just awkward. Or now when I have to talk to him, it's going to be it's going to be an hour phone call or two hour phone call and all these kind of conversations. Right. Well, the reality is we're all busy and there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, so this app is really kind of genius in the sense that you load those people into the app that are most important to you. And it's got some patent pending technology that basically when you open up the app. Can I do it? Yeah, can absolutely. Here? I don't know if this is going to work. But, but basically um, when you launch the app, you'll see on your screen 
So this is your juggle home screen. Every time I open this, I can see one person that's the next most important person to me, okay? Not the most urgent, not the person who's emailing the most, not the person who's texting me the most. This is somebody I've determined is somebody is important to me and I wanna stay in touch with them. And from this screen, I can call or text or email. And when I come back to the home screen, what's gonna happen is they're gonna go back in somewhere in the rotation and another face is gonna come up. So I don't know about you, but anytime I've ever done a to-do list or anything along those lines, what happens is I have 13 priority ones, you know, sometimes 13 priority one A's and one B's and stuff like that. But what happens is you only do the ones that are the easiest or the low hanging. You never get to the ones that, that appear more difficult or that you feel like need to come up at a different time. And Juggle reduces all of that decision fatigue. It allows you simply to focus on staying in touch with the people that are most important to you. I tell you, like um, now I'm at the point where every Thursday morning from nine to 10, it's on my calendar, it just says juggle. And I literally just take that time out to connect with the next handful of people that are on my juggle. It's really neat for me to see now when I go in my recent phone calls, it used to always be the same three or four people. Yeah. And now it's like, oh, I'm so glad I caught up with Betty. I'm so glad I caught up with Tim. I'm so glad, like having these really rich conversations. And as you know, in business and in life, these are what opens doors. These are what opens new conversations, new possibilities, new opportunities. Um, it's, it's really just been the intentionality that I think so many of us are missing when we talk about who's important to us and, and, and having that conversation with ourselves and being real. Does that make sense? No, <laughs> no. It, it, it actually, it's pretty, it's pretty fascinating because like when you and I were, were uh, talking last time I was in town, actually, I think we were drinking last time I was in town a lot uh I think so. yeah back patio i had a new <laughs> bottle of irish booze that uh, i told the wife i'd save some for and i'm pretty sure we killed that whole bottle uh which was actually very tasty i need to remember there was, what that bottle there was other was. people was, there was, obviously oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah a- absolutely but that's the one of the things that i feel guilty about right is i mean i'm, I'm driven to be a hammer and and so my work ethic is so incredibly strong that I mean from the time my feet hit the floor to the time I hit my, my head hits a pillow at night, I I'm just I'm constantly in work mode. Where even to the point where Laura will go, Hey, when was the last time you talked to your dad? And I'm like, Oh damn, man, I ain't talked to my dad in two weeks, mm-hmm. you know. Or when was the last time you talked to Regal, you know, who's now the CEO of his company, who so he's equally as busy, right? And right. and it just you sit there and go, God, man, I've been so focused on career stuff and business and everything else that I, I, I wake up and realize that the people that I really do care about most, I haven't talked to in days, weeks, months, years, <laughs> right? Right, right. And then when you do call them, you're just like, hey, man, you were on my mind and what's going on? And... And I have. I've tried to set like little reminders and stuff like that. But just like you were saying, is with people like you and I, lists just become lists, right? Right. And and and, and even as intentional as we want to be about them, we're not list people. We're not checkbox people. And so having something that can be like, hey, it's so and so's birthday, or hey, so and so's anniversary, or hey, um, just because you haven't talked to your friend in the last six weeks and you need to ping them and check on them, see what's going on. That, to me, you, it sounds like you've taken a component. I, I think a lot of times technology has driven a wedge in our ability to communicate. And it sounds like you've created a technology component yeah. to remove the wedge that has caused the barrier that I think we all fall into the trap of, right? hundred percent. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny you hit on that because when we, when we really started setting out on, okay, who, who are we and what, what's the story we want to tell? We were excited about the idea in our minds, we were social media 2.0, right? If you think back to 20 years ago when social media really started kind of becoming in our consciousness as a society, it was like, well, this is great. I'm going to, I'm going to stay in contact with people and I'm going to be able to develop these relationships and I'll get to know more and more and more and more people. But what actually happened was the people that are the loudest get the most attention. The people that aren't screaming at you fall to the wayside and then you, you lose touch and you lose contact with them. And it's, it's really a harmful thing. You know, we have a, um, he's actually a CEO of a pretty large company here in town and he's been using Juggle. And he says, he says to us one day, he goes, man, I, I got to tell you, I'm really enjoying Juggle because it's forcing me to have real conversations with people. 
and I didn't realize what's happened to me is that everything I do from an efficiency standpoint is about one to many communication. I want to send a letter out to a lot of people. I want to send a text out to a lot of people and send an email out to a lot of people, right? What Juggle's forcing him to do is be like, hey, my secretary, Paula, who I hired three weeks ago, I still don't know who her husband's name is, you know, or I don't know what her kids are, or where their kids are at and stuff like that. So he's like, I sit down and I intentionally say, when Brenda comes up, I'm going to go do a walk with her for 15, 30 minutes to get to know her and to get to understand her. And as, of course, as a business owner, you understand that those conversations is where the, where the gold is from a connection standpoint, but then also just from, a, from an ability to, to kind of grow that relationship and, and you know, get more out of, of them and their life, right? So, so these are the kind of conversations that we're having. Um, you know, I, we had one guy call us up and say, my mom called me, um, or when I, when I called my mom last week, she goes, what's wrong? <laughs> and I said, what? She goes, you're calling every week now. And he, and he's like, at first that was really sad. Cause it's like, well, I should have called her all the time. But then it was yeah. like, this is great. Cause I'm actually developing that relationship with my mother. And you said your father, you know, those kind of conversations, those are happening and are happening a lot right now with juggle. And it's, it's really getting exciting because I think we're building a story here right in Fort Worth of this, we called it social media 2.0 initially, but now we're saying we are what social media promised. Social media promised us that we would be closer to those who are important, and we're developing an app and a technology that allows people to actually get closer with people that are important to them. And it's, it's just it's been it's been eye opening. It's been a ton of fun. Um, we're, we're super excited about it, as you can tell. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, yeah. It, there's it's hard to have any conversation with you that you're not excited <laughs> about something. But but no, there this this really kind of it really strikes a um, a note with me though. Because by design, I don't intentionally not try to think about people. Again, I'm a hammer, right? Like if you look at my – a lot of people hear me refer to culture index all the time, right? Yep. And I mean my A trait and my C trait are as far apart as possible, which means my sense of urgency to go do things and go win and go be who I am is just a it's – a, it's a blessing and a curse. But I don't intentionally – not want to keep in touch with the people that I truly care about. And it's not that, that I care so little about them that I don't think about them. It's just that's how fast yep. my brain works. Like, it, it, Laura tells me all the time, she was just like, she could see it in my face. She'd been married to me long enough. Is She'll look at me and say, I'd ask you what you're thinking, but I know you need time to be able to... F- figure out how to get it from your brain to your mouth, right? Because my brain is operating it so fast because I'm always trying to be a critical problem solver, right? I love problems. I love complex problems where I'm trying to solve that to make things bigger, faster, stronger, more efficient. So it's just that, not that I intentionally didn't think about the people I care about. I'm just so hyper-focused on things that I'm doing where even Laura, my own wife, who not only am I married to, live with, but business partners with, still has to pull me aside and go, hey, pay attention to me. You do realize that we're, we're, we live in the same household. And, and, and it's just, again, the way I'm wired. And so that feeling of guilt. Yep, I was just gonna ask you that. True. What's man. that feeling when, like I had it happen today. Do you know Andrew Harris? Maybe yes. I, maybe yeah. I shouldn't say his name. Yeah. Andrew H? Yeah. <laughs> um, he, he downloaded Juggle today because yeah. he got an email from somebody else about it. Um, and then saw I was on it. So there's a yeah. quick ad feature when you see people on a leaderboard and say, oh, this person's using Juggle, I'll, I'll juggle them as yeah. well. That ba- that's basically that person telling you you're important to them. Yeah. So maybe they're important to you. Maybe they're not. But those are good conversations to have. Anyway, Andrew downloaded it and added me and texted me. He goes, hey, I just texted you from Juggle. And I was like, obviously, I enjoyed it, right? Because yeah. it's a Juggle conversation. But Andrew is one of those people that I absolutely adore. And it's embarrassing as heck that it's been two years since we talked, a year and a half since we talked. It frustrated me to no end, but it also made me so happy to see his name come up, to have a conversation for the next 20 minutes. And like I told you before, now I go to my recents and it's like, oh, Andrew Harris is there. Andrew Harris is there. Andrew Harris is there. And as you know, at some point that'll fade off the screen. And if I'm not intentional about it, it may fade for another year or two or more. And that's what Juggle's preventing. It's, it's just a really cool conversation. And I'm telling you, honestly, like, you know, we're bipolar. We're the same profile, yeah. too. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, no, we are. We you, are. Get, you get high highs and you get low lows. And I was, oh, in, yeah. I was in a low low. And Andrew texted me. And that's what picked me up out of that moment, I swear. Those are the kind of opportunities that Juggle is creating for people to reach out and reconnect. Yeah. And I, and I can give you a recent example of this. Is So I was driving back from my house on, in Colorado on Sunday. And... Uh, 
And I was like, God, I, I got to call Lindsay, my sister-in-law, because this is this is how bad this is with me just being driven to go do what I do. My sister-in-law got a real estate license, and she's back in January, and she had pinged me in this was February or March, saying, "Hey, you know, I'm trying to get into the industry." And she knows I'm in the top one percent producers. She was like, "I would just." Need, you know, would love some tips, everything else, what to do. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. You're my sister-in-law. I want to see you succeed. I want to, you know, her, her her son, my nephew, who just graduated from TCU, had been interning for me for the last year. So absolutely. Two months go by. And so I'm driving back from Colorado, and I was like, I, I haven't called Lindsay. And it wasn't like, oh, hey, I missed her call last week. I'm talking about months. And so I was just like, ah. Yep. And it's that whole, now I've got to pick up the phone and I'm going to try not to be a dick, right? Not that I'm sounding like one, but I haven't called for two, three months. And and it went to voicemail and I was like, oh man, you know, and then, she, but she calls me right back and I was like, hey, what's going on? And so we start talking about, you know, what's going on with her and everything else. And, uh, and I was like, man, I, 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 I gotta get. I've got to get better at this because, man, come on, man. I'm 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 climbing on a half century old now, right? <laughs> I've, I've been on and and the one thing that I I am starting to gain greater appreciation for is even though I am in the prime of just hitting grand slams and doing great in business, you know, as my daughter told me on my birthday, which I was told her I was going to cut her out of the will on this one. She goes, "Hey, do you realize you're now closer to death than birth?" <laughs> <laughs> like, like, thanks, right? But it starts happening with age, right? You start sure. going, hey, wait a minute. There's a lot of important people in my life that when you do call them and in their initial response is, is everything okay? God, it's just this overwhelming feeling of guilt. of like, no, it is. And, man, I, I, I should be better at being in contact. Like, even when I called my dad and, and I was like, man, you know, so I'm on the road, so I'm calling everybody, right? You know, I got 12 hours on the road. I'm going to call everybody and their sister. And my dad tells me, yeah, um, man, I, you know, I, I'm so glad you called and we did. We're laughing, we're joking and everything else. And I was like, yeah, dad, I'll, I'm sorry I haven't called you in a couple of weeks. And that's what I find. I'm, I'm always apologizing. Dad, I'm sorry I haven't called you in a couple of weeks. And he goes, look, son, I know you're really busy. And he goes, and that's the reason I don't call you is because I know you're probably not going to answer because you're probably in the middle of a meeting or you're in the middle of a deal, and I don't want to disrupt that because I know you're at the high point of success in your life, and I just don't want to interrupt that. So now I've created such an environment in my life that not only am I not calling them, but they've stopped calling me because they're afraid to interrupt right. my busyness. Right. And it's just like, this is not this is not what I want to be and who I want to be and where I want to be. And so, you know, as you and I have talked more through the, the, the juggle app is the more it just weighs on my mind more and more of like, hey, I've just got to be intentional and just get in here and start loading things in here because if I even if it's just once a week I open it up, right? Then it's just like, oh wow, I need to call Chuck or yep. oh yeah, I need to call dad or hey, as it turns out, it's my nephew's birthday <laughs> or yep. whichever, yep. right? Yep. Yeah, I, I would encourage you to use it once a week because you'll see that it has to be an everyday thing at some point because it's it's I don't want to say it's addicting. But yeah. it really does kind of feed this like I'm I'm becoming a better person. I like where I'm going. I like the legacy I'm starting to build. Um, you know, one of the most powerful things that can happen in juggle is you delete somebody. Somebody comes up to the top of the screen. At, at some point I said they were important. I wanted to talk to them and make sure it was at least every three or four months. I call them that time. Next time it pops up, I say, no, we're good. Like, I, you know, some, something or someone has happened and I don't think – I need to be intentional with that person anymore. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Give yourself permission to say, I've only got so many hours in the day. You know, you know this because you have that tier system where you kind of are judging yeah. people or grading people at least into how important they are to you. Yeah. Not everybody can be top priority one hour a day. We would never get anything done. Yeah. So for example, you know, a vendor that you used to work with that you really liked and something happened or whatever, that's cool. Delete them, move on. Conversely, I had a conversation. I went out with somebody who I was juggling that was, you know, set to, you know, very distant, four, five, six months. And we're talking over lunch, and she basically broke down and cried and told me she had she had cancer and that she was going to go through chemo for 10 weeks. And in that moment, like in the moment, I can change her from six months to one week. 
and I made sure I text or called or sent a video once a week for those 10 weeks. And you can't tell me, one, that didn't make a difference, but two, there's no way in heck I would have remembered to do that if it wasn't for Juggle. Man, let me tell you how powerful this tool is. And I've referenced this on a couple of the episodes that I've recorded here. So I've I've hired uh, a new guy to be on my team, James Peterson, right? Right. I intentionally don't bring on people that have real estate experience. Now, I want them to have business experience, sales experience, and all that, but I don't want them to bring the old habits, right? But he's coming from insurance, which is like a brisket on a green egg, <laughs> slow and low. You take three years to build a relationship with someone to get them to the table. Whereas in real estate, we're like a black and blue filet mignon from Del Frisco, seared hot and fast, right? And, and so uh, when... Like, even though I have today on my calendar, I I literally live each day and each moment by a calendar, right? Like, when somebody says, hey, what are you doing next week? I'm like, let me look at the the calendar, right? Because I'm trying to be very much in control of my time. Because one thing I've learned is the more successful you become, if you don't control your time, other people and other things will control it for you. 100%. Um, But so I'm here it is now I'm living and dying by a calendar. So... James, a couple of weeks ago, said, hey, um, yeah, I, I, I was uh, on this Facebook page with a bunch of other agents, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, first off, stop doing that, right? And I was like, because if they have time to be jacking around on Facebook, they're not out here creating value for their clients. And he said, yeah. And he goes, well, you know, this one guy popped in and he goes, I, I felt like I had to engage because they were, they were having a debate over which keychain would be the best marketing tool to draw in more business. And he just chimes in and it was just like, man, I don't know why y'all are arguing over keychains because I just came on to a team that's doing over 40 million a year. You know, last year, right? This year, we do around 60, right? Next year, we're already, already, already on pace to do over 100. And it was, just, they were like, oh yeah, it's probably because I got a heavy advertising budget. He goes, actually, they don't advertise. There's, there's two places I advertise. Fort Worth Club Magazine, because I like being a center of fold. So that way, when we go down there for those monthly deals, I just like hearing Gordon Rhodes go, there you were, centerfold again. And I was like, that's the only reason that I spent a couple of grand a year is to yeah. hear Gordon say that, right? It. And then, um, you look man, great, talk you, about, you look great in a talk about uh, man, talk about growing up with no money and then being able to have the disposable income to do a centerfold of a private club, just so that way your buddy can make comments about it, right? And then the other one is uh, from my buddy, uh, Donnie Bovine, sure. who, you know, which is to support him. Like, I'm like, yeah, dude, I'll do it just because you're another Marine. I care about you. I care about your success. You have this magazine. I'm going to advertise in it. Look, if I get business out of it, great. If I don't, look, I'm not doing it that way. So I was explaining this to James, and the point I'm getting to is we're in the relationship business, which means the volume of business that we do is not because our name and face is on a billboard or, like, somebody in town who has them on bus stops where people sleep on uh, or buses, you know, or whichever, because yeah, do you get business, but maybe, maybe not, which is funny because I believe that in the next 18 months, I'll surpass that person's level of business and they're spending a lot more money than I am because it comes down to those personal relationships, right? Because over 95% of the volume that we do is with the relationships of people that we have because and I even mentioned this on, on, on the last episode that I just recorded, which is when I have friends call me and go, hey, man, I got, I'm got i sending somebody, I'm sending somebody. I'm like, man, that's that's a great honor because you're trusting me with your that relationship. And I had one buddy go, hey, man, I'll, I'm sending another one, man. I love it because I'm able to help you make money. And I said, man, while I greatly appreciate that, I'd rather it be that you're sending them to me because I, I have the most trusted team in this industry. Right. Right. That is the brand. That is the reputation that I fight and claw and make sure that it's protected. And so as I was telling James this, as I said, there's so many people that are already in your career. I said, you're going to be successful in this business because you, you know, because the first thing I would, you know, I spent the last two years being very intentional of who I was going to hire. And one of the first questions I ask is how many people are in your phone? Right. And if somebody was like, I don't know, 100, I'm like, eh, well, not going to work. You know, because if you don't know how to establish relationships, I'm not saying that having 100 people is a bad thing. Those are probably 100 important people to right, you. Right. But if you're going to go work in an extroverted environment that involves sales, you probably need to have more than 100 people in there. Or it's going to be I'm not saying you're not going to be successful. I'm just saying there's going to be a long hill climb sure. up to that. So I say, man, you've already got the network of people 
that are going to become your clients because they love you, they care about you, and they want to support you. But more importantly, you have their trust already. And you're augmenting that with the trust of the span group that just spent years, you know, establishing this brand. So I said, you've got to be making phone calls. But he cuts in that insurance industry. Like even today, he was just like, yeah, man. I was like, how many phone calls did you make yesterday? He goes, 15, five of them are cold calls. I was like, why are you making cold calls? Stop making cold calls. Why are you calling people that have no relation to you, no trust or anything else? You've got plenty of people in your phone. Call them, right? Right. And, and I just think that an app like this that takes these folks, that as you're speaking with them, because we, we want to go help people. Yes, certainly our time is not free. We want to be compensated for what we do, but we want to help other people. So it's like, hey, if you call your friend Bob, who pops up and it turns out Bob's having a kid, turns out it's his fifth kid, and he lives in a three-bedroom, two-bath house, you probably need to move Bob up to the weekly to be like, hey, <laughs> Bobba, you're going you're gonna to need a bigger house. Right. You know, or if right. it's like, hey, Laura and Jeremy Spann, you're empty nesters, you know, does that 4,000-square-foot house still need to be what you need? It's time to downsize. 100%. So this can be not only that, but a powerful business tool that allows you to stay because that's ultimately what happens is people make a decision based on what's going on in their life to buy and sell a house that they either live in or want to go live in, right? Or a pandemic where it was just like, yeah, I mean, I was totally cool with renting the rest of my life, but now I've learned that I want to go have a house because I don't want to be stuck in an 850 square foot apartment with 400 other people in my apartment complex during a global pandemic where we couldn't go anywhere for 90 <laughs> right. days, right? And so as you and I were talking last time I was in town, I was like, man, this is for someone, for any of the audience that's listening right now, if you're in the business of networking, right? Because your network is your net worth, then you need to download this app. You need to get intentional about it. You need to start practicing and utilizing it because the relationships, when you care about other people and you demonstrate you care about them and you actually have a business that services a need that they have, then you're most likely to be the person that they call and it allows you to stay relevant and top of mind, right? 100%. Because in today's social media, like what you're talking about is social media has become very one directional. People yelling their opinions to be one directional and if you dislike or make a comment, then they unfriend you or whatever else. Now, Chris Powers has taken that to a whole different level with his ability to communicate with the free world on Twitter to make it a conversation and I learned a lot from him doing that. But so I got into the Twitter thing and I, it, but man, it became time consuming that I just don't have, right? Time is a commodity. We can't buy more of it. We can't get a refund on it once spent. And, and, and so you have to figure out how, what am I going to do to manage and control my time? And what you have created is the ability to help you control that element of time on something that is the most essential part of being a human being, which is demonstrating to other human beings that you're curious about what's going on with them, you care about them, and now here's something that can say, hey, don't forget, it's time to call your sister-in-law who got a real estate license mm -hmm. six months ago, and you're one of the top experts in the industry from coast to coast, and she called you just wanting to be able to talk about it, and you haven't returned a phone call in six months, right? And like, whoa. That's huge. Yep. This is an incredible, credible, credible piece of technology yeah. you guys have created. That's awesome, man. I appreciate it. You're, you're so spot on. You know, this is when I had the marketing agency, we got approached a lot by apps, right? And it was always one of, you know, they always wanted you to work for free for equity <laughs> and they were never really well funded. So one of the things I loved about Juggle was not only was he well funded, he has an amazing team. There's an amazing board of directors. And, and now we've got about six of us that are working, working really hard on this right now. Mm -hmm. So I love the team superstars. You obviously know John. John is yeah. not only a passionate, passionate networker and connector of people. Um, but he's also a visionary, and this is what he always kind of says: is not only will, you, not only can you have the life you want, you will. And it's about intentionality that most people never really take time out for. One of the biggest questions we get when people download the app is, "Well, can I just upload all of my contacts?" And that's like the biggest mistake, right? Because you have so many contacts, and you don't necessarily want to go. Do you really want to talk three thousand people? You don't want to go no. deep with three thousand people. Yeah right? And you've heard of the Dunbar principle, right? Yeah. Like the idea that you can only really maintain so many relationships, somewhere between 100 and 250, they usually say 150, right? 
this technology, which we're kind of positioning as technology for good, like this isn't the, the swipe for hours and the doom scroll and all this. This is actually technology you get in, you get deeper with people, and you get out. And it's, it's just, it hasn't been done. It's really, to me, the next generation of technology. You know, we've had 20 years of the internet and what it does to us. You've seen, have you seen Social Dilemma, the movie? And those, we've seen the harmful effects of what it does to society, what it does to people. We're trying to bring it back to a human scale. And, and the stories that are obviously coming out are just super powerful. And, and I really do believe it's going to change the world. Yeah. And, you know, and here's the thing is you don't have a choice but to be married to technology. Now, <laughs> right. Right. Like yeah. if, if you don't, then, I mean, what are you, what are you doing? Like, I, like I've, I've been very fortunate. The pandemic allowed me to take my business model to where I wanted to take it prior to the pandemic. But it's an antiquated industry where both consumers and vendors and participants in it just didn't quite want to let go of the old antiquated ways. And then, boom, global pandemic. It was like, boom, I can execute on how to go do this new level, right? Which was to bring in the experts to be able to service the clients in, in ways that were above and beyond. The, the, the level of service they were getting, even though I felt like they were getting the best service with us before, they're getting even better service. And I wanted to be able to operate remotely, right? And But what good is it having, you know, the most toys when the music stops playing, when you look around and there's no one there to enjoy that with? Right. And, and, and a prime example of that, a very good friend of mine, Chris Swartz. I've been incredibly close friends for many years. Got carte blanche, got his own week up at my house in the mountains every year. Just, just great, great guy. And years ago, um, he had told me, you know, I, um, his, his mom had passed away. And, and as soon as I had heard that, and this is when I was still in the PD and I was still doing undercover human trafficking work, is I was, I had just flown back in and I called him and I was just like, hey, man, I, I'm sorry about your mom. And he's just like, yeah, man. He goes, I just, this is, this freaked me out. And I'd lost my mom a couple of years earlier. And I, I absolutely understood that, you know, like, well, I lost my mom brain cancer as well in 2009, August 2009. And so I was like, man, I'm on my way over. And he's like, man, look, I'm really tired. And I was like, dude, the day you decided to become friends with me, it was more of a rhetorical request. I'm on my way, whether you like it or not. And, uh, and by the way, I am the police. So you can call the police all you want, but I'm coming through that door. And so anyhow, we get out there, we open up a bottle of scotch, and we're sitting out there smoking some cigars and, and, and enjoying some scotch. And, um, and I just said, hey, man, I, I, I'm sorry what you're going through with your mom. I should have been around a lot more, you know, because I've known she's been sick for a while. And you were there for me while my mom was sick. And he looked at me and he said, you know, Span, he goes, one of the things I learned to accept about you a long time ago is you're no less better of a friend because you're not around. I just had to learn to accept that my friendship with you is cyclical. It's not that I'm not your friend all the time. It's just you're going to come and go based on what's going on in your life. And he goes, and the faster I, I came to accept that, the easier I had it to, to be able to have this relationship with you because he is one of my closest friends. And I was like, that is the most fucked up thing I have ever been told. And he was fully right. Yep. But I was just like, is, have I really created this environment where my friend's got to go, nah, hey, man, look, he'll be your best friend, but just understand it's going to be cyclical. And even though since that was a number of years ago, things haven't changed. He'll pop up in my mind, and, I'll, and I will, and I'll be like, hey, what are you doing? And he'll ask me, like, everything all right? And I'll be like, nah, man, I just wanted to call and harass you. <laughs> and he'll be like, hey, I'll remind you, you still got your week up in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And, 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 but, so that's why the impact of what this app can do for even degenerates like myself who are so heavily focused on being out there to win, to go, it's time to slow down for at least a few minutes out of my week to open up an app and go, who's top of mind today? And then, you know, like you said, it, you know, being addicting because then the next person pops up, the next person pops up, the next person pops up. And then you realize, wow, there's a lot of people that, you know, it really does touch your lives, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, or like one, one of my business practices, I don't do it as much now, um, namely because my role is always evolving and changing within our group, right? And I'm focused more on the investment side for our clients. So um, now that James is on, he's absorbing more of the business development side and I'm going over to more of the investment side, side of things. We're uh, not making as many contacts, but one of the things that I, that I did uh, prior to the pandemic is I wrote two note cards a week, right? 
I can't tell you how many people would call me and say, you have no idea what it meant to me to go to the mailbox and clear out all the other BS that comes in there because everything's paid online and to see a card with your chicken scratch on there, which you can barely read, like happy it made it to the address <laughs> and it opened it up. And I've even had the occasions where I'd walk into somebody's office and I'm seeing a note card that I know that I wrote six months ago. And I was like, damn, man, the, mail, the post office is getting slow. They just now delivered it. And it's like, no, I, I got it six months ago. I'd keep it on my desk. And I'm like, why? And it'd be like, because in the last five years, no one's written me a note card. And you did. And it really meant to me something to me. And it meant something to me on that particular day that it came right. because I was having a bad day or whatever else. So essentially, you, you, you've you become that same element with this app is to be able to still touch people and say, hey, you matter to me. And 100%. I'm sorry yep. that I'm not always present. I'm sorry I'm not always there. I'm sorry I missed your kid's all-star football game or whichever, but I still want you to know that matters. You matter, you know, that we matter together. And this this app does that. Right. Yeah, you know, another question we get a lot, sometimes they'll, they'll be like, well, I don't need to put my, my wife in here or my best friend or whatever. Um, you do, though, because that takes on a different meaning at that moment, right? It's yeah. not about, oh, I, I woke up next to my girlfriend today, so I can mark her off the list. When, when, when Jen, who you know, you know, my girlfriend, mm-hmm. when she comes up on my list, it's not about I made a contact with her. It's that I did something special. And that could be, you know, flowers or a note, or it could be a date, or it could just be a random message in the middle of the day, which may have that same effect where it really brightens her day or it says, hey, he's thinking about me, like, you know, we're we're, we're still good. And I I know he's busy, but he's thinking about me. Like, those are the kind of moments that are super, super special and intentional. So when you load somebody in the juggle, it may be a, a really unique and rare opportunity to call, but it also may be that opportunity to take that next step to do a handwritten letter, to do, you know, to visit somebody. Yeah. Heaven forbid, right? There's a gamification oh. piece to this where an in person's worth more than a call, is worth more wow. than that. It, it yeah. kind of motivates you to say, like, okay, I want to I want to go deeper with this person. This person's important to me. Yeah. And, you know, and this is the funny thing. And it is, it is, I'm hoping people that are listening to this aren't thinking that I'm just some kind of, you know, born again asshole or anything, <laughs> right? But I mean, like, this is just how driven in my, my, my brain is, is even on my, mirror in my bathroom where I go to brush my teeth every night. I've got a big sign that says, did you, you know, did you do everything you did? You're supposed to do today. Did you leave it all on the table? Did you tell your wife you love her? I mean, it's like literally I have to have a written reminder on the very thing I look at to brush my teeth to be able to go, Oh yeah. And you tell my wife, I love her. And it's not because I don't. And it's not because I don't want to tell her. It's just, that's how my mind is by design. So to have a tech matter of fact, when are you going to do this where it puts a chip in my head so it automatically it's doesn't coming. even have to. They don't even it's have to coming. look at the phone to do this. Yeah, yeah. No, it's definitely coming. Yeah. Proximity sensors. Those are all things around the <laughs> board. Um, you know, what, one thing John and I got into a, a pretty good argument early on about this was because I wanted separate screens for you know friends versus business, and John was really adamant that people are people, and if yeah. you're if you're maintaining a relationship with them, it shouldn't matter what what they are. You know, whether they're a work relationship or a personal relationship or a family or whatever. These are the people that are important to you. Period. Yeah. Right. Now that said, we do have potential here to use this exact same technology for business as an overlay onto a CRM, for example. So salespeople just like to sell. They don't like to mess with a CRM. Mm -hmm. Well, Juggle has the capability to integrate with that CRM. So as they just make phone calls and texts and emails and all that, it populates the CRM, which is what people at the back office actually care about and want to see, right? So there's that potential. And then one of the reasons we very purposely called the company Juggle Apps is because the same technology is applicable to other industries, other to-do lists or anything where people can chime in and and see that other people are working on something. So for example, um, like you happen to own a bar and restaurant too, right? Mm -hmm. So if we had a juggle apps or juggle juggle pizza, right? Because you have Mm -hmm. a pizza pizza place, right? So at the pizza shop, there's certain things that need to happen. You need to clean the windows once a day. You need to clean the oven once a week. You need to change the air filters once every three months. All of those things are loaded to juggle. Now your employees, all they do is open up juggle and there's going to be one ball that's next. And that might be clean the windows because it's once a day, or it might be clean the air filters because it's been three months since that appeared at the top. But that dynamic display that we kind of have working for Juggle and what, what makes it so special is applicable to all these other industries, all these other opportunities, all of these other business applications. That's obviously another side of this thing that we're super excited about. So if I understand this right, is this is to help you control the chaos. Exactly. It's about intentionality. 
Like yeah. what it just think of all these things you forget and if you can load them into some place it will appear again. <laughs> it's I powerful. Have a, I have I have a I have a question for you. Okay. All right. And I want you to answer this honestly for me. On Friday at 1:49 you sent me a text. I need more span in my life. <laughs> Was that because I popped up in juggle? 110%. That's awesome though. And it made me go I bet you juggle told me, and I'm not offended by it at all. I'm like, no. I'm like, that's awesome because I look. There's, I love humans. I really do. I mean, I wouldn't have spent a lifetime in service if I didn't really care about people. You know, yeah. doesn't mean I like them. I can care about you and not like you, right? I mean, I've I've, I've protected a lot of people that I cared about, but it really didn't like them, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> of course, people would say the same thing about me. My wife's like, yeah. I mean, either. <laughs> Dude, people, people either love you or they wouldn't piss on you if you're on fire, man. I mean, you're one of the, one of the two. Uh, but um, but it, there are a handful of people that when I get this out of the blue message from, you know, because I, I I mean, look, we we've been sitting in here recording for an hour. I have 83 missed messages on my text. <laughs> I have 11 missed calls because I cleared everything out before we yeah. started this, and I have 57 missed emails. Like that is what my day is, which is really funny because people go, oh, man, you, you make all this look so easy. I was like, dude, I'm telling you, if you were to download the, the usage on my phone, you would throw up in your mouth. You'd be like, how do you manage getting 100 texts, which, yes, some of these may be a couple of messages in a thread, but I can promise you if I pull it up, there's at least 50 different segments yep. of who's doing what. And, 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 and so it, it, it becomes a bit of a beating after a while, right? Because you're like, okay, that one's part of this deal, or I need to do that, or I need to return this phone call, or blah, 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 blah. So it's just, I really despise looking at my phone a lot of times because it's just going to be I'm responding to the next you know, threat, the next the next problem or whatever else. But when I do get to open it up and I see a text from my friend, you know, because it does a preview, Chuck, that says, I need more span in my life. And I see that, dude, just that, instantaneous moment I'm like man it's made my day right <laughs> yeah. because most people that text me and call me and email me they're doing it because they want something from me want me want a piece of me want some you know there's something that somebody else wants yep. that when it's different it's just like man you, well I guess you, know, you didn't need more you, know, you don't want a piece of band yeah. <laughs> but, but it was just you, you see that and you're just like hey that that really makes a lot of difference, right? It's like the story I told you about Andrew Harris literally yeah. today, right? Yeah. And, and and that's a really important point I want to touch on because it's, you almost feel like you're gamifying your life a little bit. But the reason you came up and you came up two weeks after we met last time yeah. was because when I left that meeting, I felt so energized by our conversation. I was like, that is a good dude. That is somebody I need more of in my life. Now, I got to figure out how to provide value to you and, and be a part of that conversation. But in that moment, it, literally in the car, in your driveway, I bring you up say yes we met we met in person and instead of being every four months i want it to be every two weeks yeah and now you come up in two weeks and then i have that conversation again do i need yeah. it do i need it to be more do i need it to be less or whatever yeah intentionality you're you're in colorado now in nine months of the year right <laughs> i'm not going to see you around as much as i did now, if colorado to government's listening to that it's less than less than 50 oh, yeah, yeah, of no, the year absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. it was absolutely. nine weeks nine yeah, weeks yeah, nine yeah. weeks <laughs> five months and three weeks every year you're up there but, but that's, what it, that's what it allows us to do is have that yeah. intentionality. And I'm saying, you know what? Jeremy's a good dude. I need him yeah. in my life more. And that and that's literally why I did that text. That's why I'm here today. That's why yeah. you didn't just skip over it. You said, okay, how do I how do I connect with Chuck more? Well, shit, I should bring him on the podcast. Yeah. And now we're here. Well, and you know, and it, and it was really interesting because your timing is, so I've had this significantly large deal that I've, I've been working on for about three years, but the last six weeks it has grabbed a set of legs. And I mean, and I not exaggerate when I'm talking 16 hours a day, seven days a week. It's the probably the primary reason why I have all these missed calls and everything else because, you know, when someone's getting ready to spend millions beyond millions of dollars on something, they just don't go, hey, man, uh, we just want to give you this money to go do this and just <laughs> let us know how it goes, right? I mean, right. like literally, they got a hand all the way up my ass like a puppet, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it, I mean, they're, they're, they want to know anything and everything and all these bits, and which naturally, yes, I mean, because if I was going to spend that kind of money, I'd want to know as well. So, but, but I was, when you sent me this message last week, uh, which uh, last week was like, like six days ago, five days ago, whichever is, I was like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to record next week. 
And I was like, and, you know, of course, I have a production team that does everything for me. It's really easy. I get to show up, talk <laughs> with folks. They do everything. But I was like, but they have the list of, hey, these are the people or have they been scheduled? And I was like, oh, man, I need to. And then, uh, but you had been on their, yeah, yeah. Their, their master list, right? Because these people did a great job. Anybody ever wants to start a podcast, y'all need to reach out to Aaron Greger. Innovation Media Enterprises, and they do everything. So they spent months interviewing me on Zoom calls of understanding me, my intentionality, where I wanted to go, where I wanted to be. Like, I've got some friends that are a little behold hurt because they haven't been on here yet. And I'm like, hey, don't talk to me. Talk to Aaron. <laughs> like, go, go to the master list, right? Nice, nice. And, um, but you had been on that list, and, and then she was like, hey, have you reached out to these people to tell them that you need them to come be a guest? And so it was a reminder, like, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to ask Chuck. And I was like, I hope he's free next week. Because <laughs> I was supposed to ask him, like, six weeks ago oh, when great. Aaron yeah, originally yeah. asked me, like, yeah. hey. But it, it was like, oh, yeah, hey. And it was perfect timing, too, because I was like, man, they've got this app that is just really, really awesome. And it's going to solve a lot of issues and make you more intentional. And then as I um, – uh, I, I was checking my email this morning. So I, I check email twice a day. And now the only time I don't do that is when I'm in here recording for a week straight because I know that I I can't afford not to. Mm -hmm. But normally I check it just twice a day because I'm a lot more responsive. Here here I have to because if I don't answer an email, somebody will call a text and I can respond quicker. But when you're recording eight hours in a day, you don't really have that much opportunity. So I'll just check the email. So I check them first thing in the morning. And I saw the one where y'all have the new little commercial. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, And I saw that and I was like, hey, cool. So I stopped and I watched it. And then I sent it to James, and I was like, "By the way, nice." One of the owners is this is coming on coming on the show today, and he was like, "Any watch the video?" And he's like, "Dude, that's badass." And I was like, "Yeah, this thing I've been telling you, you need to download and get doing get, mm-hmm. get going, so you can stop making stupid cold calls and you can just start calling <laughs> right. people you care about who are more likely to send you business than anybody else." Hundred percent. Yeah. So well, what does this where, where does that. this go? Yeah. Where does this go for the future for you? Man, you know, I, right now we're we're really focused. We're kind of going through another round of fundraising right now. We've gotten a lot of interest around the the Salesforce overlay and the idea that this thing can tie in with CRMs. So we're trying to be really intentional with kind of this this human side and the the consumer side, the free side that you and I can use day in and day out. Um, but also being respective of the idea that there's there's a massive market and a huge potential to kind of help with this the adaptability of the CRM industry, which is absolutely blowing up. So we're doing both of those things right now. Um, super focused on being a a uh, a pillar in this in the Fort Worth tech community. So everything we've done so far is really centered around uh, Fort Worth talent, Fort Worth people, Fort Worth investors. Um, we certainly have a board that's you know in, na- international and national. Um, but but really right now it's about getting people in an area to use it and to focus on it. Because what happens is when when you download Juggle Apps, you'll see 35 people you know already using it. It becomes a lot more like uh, viral, a little bit more contagious, a little bit more of uh, growth hacking, if you will. So we're super focused on Fort Worth. And oh, by the way, you know, you're a rainmaker from Fort Worth. I'm a rainmaker from Fort Worth. John is a rainmaker from Fort Worth. We all love to connect people. So this is a tool built out of who we are and and who we are as a city, right? What do they always say about Fort Worth? Where relationships matter. Yeah. This is this is why we're here. This is this is why why we're thriving and succeeding and having a good time at life. And we want to help other people do the same thing. So what what concerns do you have on like there's 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 a lot of cyber threats out there right now, mm-hmm. right? I mean, pretty sure gas doubled in cost because hackers jumped in there and did something like that. Sure. What concern do you have on that as far as you know um, this? On what, like the data side? Yeah, the data side. Almost everything that's in Juggle comes off of your contact list that's already there. And as you know, like Apple's security measures are, are second to none right now and getting better every day. Yeah. Um, so we don't hold any proprietary information. Um, every ba- all the data that's coming across there is basically things that you've already provided or shared. So you're, if I understand this right, is you're almost like the bridge, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's literally it, it's it's a it's a it's a to do list on steroids. Yeah, and it forces you to have conversations that most to do lists would never think of. That's pretty, man. That's pretty, man. That's pretty. <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty awesome. You you did touch on something that I, I do want to take a quick moment to at least touch before we wrap this episode up is the tech side of Fort Worth, mm-hmm. right? People don't think of Fort Worth as the tech spot. They think of Austin, but sure. that has been, I from what I've seen over the last number of years, there has been a large community here that has come together to draw in 
the tech side of things. Absolutely. Tell, tell us about that. Absolutely. Well, you know, um, there's a lot of programs around here, um, you know, with Hayden's doing with Tech Fort Worth and Cam Cushman with UNT Health Sciences Center. They're doing a lot, not only to support the entrepreneurial world, I should also throw Marco from Sparkyard in there as well. Um, they're doing great things to help startups, to help tech. Um, but what we see a lot of with the tech in Fort Worth a lot of times is based around the medical community and the sciences community. And here we're doing something that's a little bit more consumer focused and consumer uh, oriented. And, and quite frankly, when we went out to try to find the talent to help bring the, the programming and the development side to life, it was really hard in this area. So it became another part of our conversation was where all of these this tech companies are booming in Austin and, and you know, to a lesser extent Dallas, but still much higher than, than most uh, on the national scene. Um, we said, why can't Fort Worth have kind of this more diverse industry as well? And, and if it's not here already, why can't we be one of the players that help bring this to life? Um, you know, John's got some pretty big visions for what happens here. And one of the things that we have a picture of in our office is a, is a multi-story building with Juggle at the top. We want the success of Juggle to resonate with Fort Worth, you know, in the same way that, you know, you know, Starbucks with Seattle or, <laughs> or yeah. any of these other yeah. major iconic uh, companies. Um, you know, we want to be that for Fort Worth and we're working hard at that. Man, that's awesome. Well, I like to, I like to wrap up every one of these episodes uh, with, you know, let's not that we would at 20, but if 20 year old Chuck would say, Hey, older Chuck, I'm willing to listen to one thing whether to go do it or not go do this, what would you go back and tell 20-year-old Chuck if you could turn back the hands of time to just say, hey, this one thing, if you're not going to listen to anything else, listen to this one thing, what would you tell 20-year-old Chuck? Um, you know, it's, 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 it's crystallized a lot more, obviously, since I've been working with Juggle. Um, this has definitely become a passion project and something I believe in. But, but one of the things I had noticed in my life's journey was, you know, I moved from, from Baltimore to Boston. I didn't know a soul built a whole other life up there, moved from Boston to, to DFW, didn't know a soul here, built built that you know community up, if you will. And now I see all the value in all those relationships and hopping around, not only industries, but physical locations. And we all kind of have these stories in one way or another, different jobs, you know, you're in the, the military and then the police force and then, you know, different communities. We don't spend enough time cultivating intentionally, cultivating relationships intentionally, that's what I always tell, like when I talk to TCU students or I'm talking to other classes, it's about understand the value of your network and that the, the value comes way down the road and in an unexpected manner. It has nothing to do with what you think it's going to be, that if you take a linear path to get there, you're probably going to be disappointed. These are the kind of conversations that, that, have, that have provided opportunities for me to look at the world differently, to help connect other people, and to just you know, have, have a ton of fun and um, you know, prosperous opportunities everywhere just because of like, genuinely giving up S about other people. <laughs> so so my, 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 yeah. my simple answer is uh, you know, cultivate relationships intentionally. Man, you know, what, I, what I love about the show is we've recorded, by the time we finish this series, over 50 episodes that answer is never the same <laughs> that's awesome you know because yeah. it's it's true it's it's yeah. it, it, you know it's authentic, authenticity when people actually don't go give the cliche answer that they would do at an interview and say no if i could really go back and talk to a 20 year old self then uh i would you know if i could go back and talk to 20 year old self be like learn to play poker better if you can play with chuck <laughs> or else you might as well just sign your 401k over to him you know <laughs> Hardly, hardly. So, so how do people yeah. find out more about you, more about Juggle, more about all this? Where, where do they go? How yeah. do they do this? Awesome. The, the simplest way is juggleapps.com. That's juggleapps.com. Obviously, we're competing against a lot of the terms juggle on the internet until mm -hmm. we get a little bigger. So it's Juggle Apps. JuggleApps.com, Juggle Apps on all the social media. We have YouTube, Insta, Facebook, um, missing one, Twitter probably. So uh, we're, we're easily found on all of those kind of things. My email is chuck at juggleapps.com. Um, would love to hear um, your thoughts about it. What we're really asking for people right now is to not only follow us on social media, but please just download the app and try to use it because we're still in a very early stage here. We're in a beta stage. Feedback is gold for us right now. So any frustrations you have, any ideas you have, please, please send them my way, chuck at juggleapps.com. Um, would love to jump on the phone or just read your email, and I, I promise you it's going to go to a good team that's, that's doing a lot of hard work to make this thing work for people. 
And in case you're driving or you're busy or doing something like that, you can always go to myexperiencedrealtor.com, and that's experience with an ED. You can click on Chuck's episode, hit the read more, and what we'll do is we'll also add a direct connection to download this awesome. uh, from the website, and you'll be able to connect th- uh, to Chuck through there. Uh, myexperiencerealtor.com to be able to learn more about this episode, learn more about Chuck. And also, if you're looking to buy and sell real estate anywhere on the planet, click the home button, go down there and click the find a trusted professional, and we will get you connected uh, with somebody that will look after your interest. Chuck, thanks for coming. Awesome, Let's go to grandma's. Thank you.